Good evening, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you. And Lord, we just pray that our hearts are open to the things you're going to share with us as we finish up the book of Leviticus tonight. Just, Lord, the lessons we need to learn. Help us to be sensitive to your Spirit's leading. And Lord, as always, we want to honor you through the worship that we do. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 25 as we're continuing our study through the Word of God. And tonight we're going to be finishing up the book of Leviticus. And before we actually dig into the text, listen to these words from Warren Worsby, who makes these comments regarding our study this evening. He wrote this. The focus in chapters 25 and 26 is on Israel in their land. In fact, the word land is used 39 times in these two chapters. The Lord's statement in verse 2, when you enter the land I'm going to give you, must have been a great encouragement to Moses, especially after Israel failed to claim their inheritance at Kadesh Barnea and had to wander in the wilderness. If the Israelites were to possess and enjoy their land, they had to recognize and respect some basic facts. The first of which was that God owned the land and had every right to dispose of it as he saw fit. God also owned the people of Israel because he had redeemed them from Egypt, Egyptian bondage. Because they belonged to him, all the Jews were to treat one another as brothers and sisters and not take advantage of one another when it came to personal debts or property claims. The Jews were expected to toil in their fields, but it was God who gave the increase and supplied them with sunshine, rain, and harvest. In other words, the people of Israel had God as their landlord and had to live by faith in his word. This meant obeying his commandments and trusting his promises. Another important fact emerges from this chapter. God was in control of the calendar. God not only gave his people their land and their food, but he also gave them special times to observe so that the land would not be ravaged and spoiled. Had Israel obeyed these principles, their economic system would have functioned smoothly. The land would have provided all they needed, and everybody would have been cared for adequately. However, they didn't obey the Lord. And the result was that the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and the land was ruined. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, it? You know, God is giving to the children of Israel, and I believe to us as well, what's best for us. And to obey what the Lord is telling us is so important because if we don't, yeah, there's some consequences that will happen. And we'll see that as we go through the word. So with that as our introduction, let's pick up Leviticus chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. We're told, And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. So the Lord is instructing Moses regarding the Sabbath of the land. And we'll see, as we're going to see, every seventh year the land was to rust. Now, here's the thing. They haven't entered the promised land yet, right? In fact, they still got some 38 years or so to go before they enter the land. But God is telling them ahead of time, You're, this land is yours. And the only reason they're not entering the land sooner was because of unbelief. They could have entered in right away. You know, as I've said before, it took them one day to get out of Egypt, and it took 40 years for Egypt to get out of them. And it's kind of like us as Christians, you know. we God brings us out of this world, this world system, but it takes a long time to get the world out of us. It takes a lifetime, really. Look at verse 3. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you and your servant, for your maidservant and your hired servant, for the stranger who sojourns with you. For your livestock and the animals that are in your land, all its produce shall be for food. So every seventh year, the land was to rust. No harvesting, no sowing, whatever grew, you were to leave alone. You think, well, 
how are they going to survive? Well, when we get to verses 18 through 22 of Leviticus 25, we're going to see that in the sixth year, God's going to provide enough food for them to eat until the eighth year when they would harvest the land once again. The land was to get rust. And the people were going to have to trust the Lord on this one, right? Now, that's kind of hard to do, right? What do you mean a whole year? God said, let the land rust and you, you will benefit from it. But they didn't, they didn't obey the Lord. They entered the land. You know how long they didn't obey the Lord? 490 years. So when the southern kingdom of Judah went into idolatry, turned from the Lord, God was going to bring them into captivity. And you know how long they were in captivity? 70 years. Because they owed the Lord 70 years where they didn't give the land rest. How sad. You know, I think uh, even today, they try and get around this. One of the ways they try to get around this is they will lease the land to a Gentile, an Arab or someone. So it's not really their land that they're working. And so the seventh year, they're not harvesting or sowing somebody else's. Well, you know, that's not what God said. You know, don't try and find loopholes. You know, others will only do one-seventh of their field. Um, and so they just work around the field, and they're always working one part of the land. Here's the thing. When God says that he's going to provide for them, that's an act of faith. You have to trust. Now they're trying to help God out. And I could just tell you from personal experience, God doesn't need our help. We, we get ourselves into trouble when we try to help God out. You know, God, I'll, I'll help you with this one. He created the heavens and earth, right? I think he can handle the situations. Um, and we have to be careful with that. We have to learn to trust in him and what he tells us to do. Well, verse 8, And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, Seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you forty-nine years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows out of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. So every fifty years was like a, a Sabbath year. Uh, many feel that Jesus began his ministry in the year of Jubilee. Don't know for sure. It's kind of interesting. Um, so I'm not going to you know, say for certain. But when he began his ministry in Nazareth, in Isaiah, uh, he quotes out of Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2a, where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is a God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Many feel that he's speaking of the Jubilee year because, well, Jesus is coming to set the captives free. Now, again, that wasn't practiced much either in Israel. The, the, the Every seventh year, not practiced. This, not practiced very much. What's interesting to me is that our founding fathers were aware of this Jubilee year. And on the U.S. Liberty Bell, they have this verse, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Yeah, tell me this wasn't a Christian nation, really. Um, but what is this Jubilee year? What, is, what does that mean? What, we're going to see that as we read on. Look at verse 13 here in Leviticus chapter 25. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. And according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. 
According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price. And according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number of the years of the crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Now, remember when the children of Israel enter the promised land. We see that when we get to the book of Joshua. The land was divided up between the various tribes and their families, so it was a permanent possession to them. It could never be sold. It could be leased for a period of time, but they couldn't lose the land. So after the seventh Sabbath years, or 49 years, the year of Jubilee was happening, all property except in the walled cities were returned to their original owners. All Hebrew slaves were set free, and the land re received a second straight year of rust in the year of Jubilee. And what did this, who did this help? It helped the poor. You see, a wealthy or powerful person can obtain all the land and gain a monopoly on it. And in the end, they would exploit the people of God. But here it's, you know, you're not to do that. You're not going to take advantage of people. God set the standards for them to live by to protect the people. So every 50th year, all the land that may have been sold because people couldn't afford it was reverted back to the family again. They never lost permanent possession of that land. Verse 18. So you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them, and you will dwell in the land in safety. Then the land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell there in safety. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce? Then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, and I'll bring forth produce enough for three years. And you shall sow in the eighth year and eat old produce until the ninth year, until its produce comes in, you shall eat the old harvest. So God's saying, look, if you obey me, I'm going to provide for you. Now, from a human perspective, that makes no sense, right? I mean, it's not like they could store this food up in their refrigerators or put them in freezers. They had to trust that God was going to provide enough food to sustain them by. And there's that trust. And what has God asked us to do individually? How to trust in him? You know, that's a big deal. I think he's still asking us to do the very same thing, that we need to trust in him. When he brought me out here from Chicago, I knew nobody up here. And yet I knew what he told me he was going to do, but I had to trust in him. You know, everyone at where I worked at the hospital in the open heart unit, they were like, what are you doing, man? Why are you moving? You don't know anyone there. And I got to share with them why I was going up there. The sole purpose was to be pastor. And it, I wonder what would have happened if I didn't trust in him. Not for you guys, because God would provide, but for me. The blessings I would miss out because I didn't walk by faith. I walked by sight. This is ridiculous. How could I do something like this? Well, because God said, and that's the key. You know, the children of Israel did not obey God, and they missed out on his blessings. Verse 23, the land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't say the land is the Palestinians. The land is not the Pope's. The land is God's. It's his land. And he's kind of leased it to the children of Israel in a sense. He gave it to them. But even for them... They couldn't lose it because it was theirs. Did God remove them from the land for a time? Yeah, punishment came upon them for their disobedience, but God has brought them back from all over the world. Now remember what it says in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Yeah, he's almighty God. He's the creator of the heavens and earth. This is all his. It's not ours. Verse 24. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions 
And if his kinsman redeemer comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale and restore the balance to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. But if he is not able to have it restored to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee, and in the, in the Jubilee it shall be released, and he shall return to his possession. Now, it'd be great if, you know, you, you had to sell your land and there was only five years till the year of Jubilee, right? But what if it's, you still got 49 years to go? You may not even be able to reap the benefits of that. You may not be able to see that. Same with the slave and so on. Now, the kinsman redeemer was a, or Goel in Hebrew, was just a near relative who could help buy back what is lost by one of the family members. If he couldn't buy it back, the owner could if he had the money. Or, again, like I said, in the year of Jubilee, it would be returned to the owner. What's interesting is Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. He's our Goel. And he purchased us out of the slave market, you might say, because we were slaves to sin, right? And we are forever free in Christ. Verse 29, if a man sells in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after he sold it. Within a full year, he may redeem it. But if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it. Throughout his generations, it shall not be released in the Jubilee. However, the houses of villages which have no wall around them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed and they shall be released in the year of Jubilee. Nevertheless, the cities of the Levites and the houses of the, in the cities of their possession, the Levites may redeem at any time. And if a man purchases a house from the Levites, then the house that was sold in the city of his possession shall be released in the year of Jubilee. For the houses in the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the field of the common land of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. So why was the property in a walled city not released in the year of Jubilee, or uh, after a year he couldn't redeem it after it was sold? Well, again, when you were out in the fields, that was your livelihood. That's where the land was divided up. And that's where you planted your crops. That's where you had all your cattle and sheep and all that. Um, so yeah, that couldn't be sold permanently. But in the walled cities, it could be. If you sold it, you could buy it back within a year. But after that year, then it was theirs. It's in a walled city. You know, you don't have you know, cattle and sheep being raised within the walled city. So it wasn't really a livelihood within those walls. Um, and for the Levites, they could re redeem it back at any time. It didn't matter if it was in the country or walled city. They could always buy that back their, uh, their homes. Verse 35, And if one of your brethren becomes poor, and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury nor lend him your food for a pro at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Now, you look at this, you go, God just wants his people to treat each other nicely, to be fair. You know, it, it's so interesting. We, you look at society today and they take advantage, right? I mean, look at credit cards. The, America today, we are in credit card debt more so than I think at any other time. You don't hear much about it. But think about it. Say you owe $20,000 on your credit card and you're paying 20, 25% interest. You're never going to pay it back. 
They're taking advantage. God is setting some rules in order to make it possible for people to survive, not to take advantage, but to help people out. We've lost sight of that today. Greed has taken over and it hurts people. Verse 39. And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave, but as a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, both he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possessions of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. And as for your male and female slaves whom you may have, from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who sojourn among you, and their families who are with you, which beget in your land. And they shall become your property, and you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them as a possession. They shall be your permanent slaves, but regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over the one another with rigor. Now, God's not condoning slavery here. He's trying to protect slaves from mistreatment. That's a huge problem, even today. You know, we don't think much of slavery today, but man, it's going on. And God's saying, no, it, you got to take care of these people. You can't mistreat them. And for the children of Israel themselves, yeah, it's a little bit different. I I own them, the Lord is basically saying, and you got to treat them well. Um, I don't think it's, I know people come and say, oh, look, God is for slavery. No, God is doing, he's making rules to protect what's already happening in society. Verse 47. Now, if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells him to the stranger or sojourner close to you or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him. Or his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or anyone who is near of kin to him in his family may redeem him. Or if he is able, he may redeem himself. Thus he shall reckon with him who bought him. The price of his release shall be according to the number of years, from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee. It shall be according to the time of a hired servant. If there are still many years remaining according to them, he shall repay the price of his redemption from the money which he, he was bought. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee, then he shall reckon with him, and according to his years, he shall repay him the price of his redemption. He shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with vigor, rigor excuse me, over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, both he and the children with him. For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So again, making sure that the slaves get, you know, taken care of, that each party, the owner and the slave in the year, you know, if they're going to be released before the year of Jubilee, that they're paid accordingly. Um, and again, because of greed today, how many just take advantage of people? And that's very sad. You know, the Lord said the children of Israel are servants to me. They're my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. They are servants of God. And that should sound familiar because what are we called in the New Testament? We're called bond slaves of Christ, right? We freely give ourselves to the Lord. We owed a debt that we could never pay back, right? Our debt was sin. But he came to set us free. He purchased us out of that sinful life. And now we serve him, not because we have to, because we love him. And, you know, I'll just share this book from, with you. It's from a book by Ellen Ross, Holiness to the Lord. 
shared a couple things from him before, but he said this, the basic principle to stress in this chapter as the rationale behind the law, laws is the Lord's oft-repeated expression, the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. God is sovereign over the affairs of the world. Thus, he has the right to release from bondage or slavery whom he wishes, to remove the land from the rich and distribute it as he wishes. This truth kept any Israelite in the physical world and should keep any minister in the spiritual world from personalizing the work given to him or her, from taking credit for it, or from jealousy guarding it as his or her own. It is a sacred trust to be removed someday when the Lord makes all things new. The truth in this passage ought to humble us in our work before God. You know, what an honor, what a privilege it is to be able to serve the Lord. I mean, he's the King of kings, Lord of lords, and God allows us to be part of the work that he's doing. Well, chapter 26 of Leviticus, verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of the vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemy shall fall by the sword before you. For I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people." I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. They should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. So God is basically telling them, look, if you obey me, you're going to be blessed. If you don't, well, yeah, then there's going to be curses that come upon the land. In these first 13 verses, we see, <coughs> excuse me, the blessing for obedience. Now, some don't like this, but it's a spiritual law. You know, we do have physical laws like gravity. Now, okay, let's say I don't like the law of gravity. I think it's foolish, ridiculous. But just because I feel that way, does it negate the law of gravity? Absolutely not. I can go to the top of a 10-story building saying, you know, I don't believe in this law of gravity. It's the most ridiculous thing. And then when I step off, I'll find out, no, it's really real. And I'll have 10 floors to think about it till I hit the bottom. I'll suffer the consequences of my unbelief. Well, that's the same thing with spiritual laws. It doesn't matter if you like them or believe them or agree with them. They're just a reality. And yeah, these are specifically for the children of Israel, but yeah, they can apply to a people and a nation. Make no mistake about it. We're blessed as we obey the Lord. You know, our lives will be refreshed. They'll be fruitful. We'll have food to sustain us, physical, spiritual, peace in our life. Not necessarily an absence from storms, but a peace that comes from God in the midst of these storms. A cleansing of our land or in our family, our workplace, our neighborhood. Our enemies, even though they're bigger, stronger, more in numbers, will flee from us. And God will walk with us. He'll lead us. He'll set us free from the bondage of sin so we can walk in his light. Those are wonderful blessings that God has for us. Well, look at verse 14 here in Leviticus chapter 26. The really conditions, results for, of disobedience. We're told this. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, 
so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of my covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, Ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back to you your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, will, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation. And I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, and you, are, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. And as for those of you who are left, I will send fatness into their hearts in, in the lands of their enemies. The sound of a shaken leaf shall cause them to flee. They shall flee as through as though fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when no one pursues. They shall stumble, stumble over one another as if it were before a sword when no one pursues. And you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. You shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And those of you who are left shall waste away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. Also in their fathers' iniquities, which are with them, they shall waste away. Well, that's not good, right? You know, 13 verses with blessings. Now there's 26 verses, twice as many for disobedience. Now, understand, God didn't send these curses upon the nation of Israel as soon as they did them. God was long-suffering. He was patient with them. His idea was that they would turn to him. But when they didn't, yeah, judgment came. And each time they didn't, get right, the curses would increase seven times more. Wow. And that kept happening. And eventually, they're going to be driven out of the land. Did it happen to the children of Israel? Absolutely. Now, what's interesting is that God's telling them that they're going to do this long before they do it. He's warning them, and he's telling them, you're going to go into captivity. These things are going to happen to you. They're not even in the land yet, right? And God's saying, when you get in there, I'm giving you a heads up. You have a choice to make, but I know what you're going to do. How sad. And it was a horrible situation when the Babylonians came in. People were starving within the city because, you know, understand, Jerusalem was a walled city. And so what the enemy would do was just surround you 
And eventually your food supply would run out and you start starving to death. And this is what we're told in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 26 through 29. We see how it's played out. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him, and I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Are you kidding me? Well, isn't that what God said? If you turn from me, these are the consequences. The enemy is going to come after you. And you could read of Josephus in the Wars of the Jews. He talks about this, how horrible it was. And I look at our nation today and I wonder, you know, how far away from judgment are we? You know, look at what happened in Afghanistan. Here we are, this mighty nation. And there's a group of rebels that are waiting to come to Afghanistan as soon as we left. We couldn't drive them out, huh? We couldn't take care of that. We let those people suffer and they're suffering now. But that's what happens when you turn from God. Small bands of people will bring turmoil upon you. How many men were in those planes that destroyed the Twin Towers and so on. Here we are, this mighty nation, and a few people almost brought us to our knees, right? We're a nation that's lost its way. And I think the warning is very clear. We need to turn back to God. We see all the wickedness in this world. It's crazy. I can't, what was it, $112 billion in 2022 from stolen merchandise. $112 billion. A lot of it was because they just walked into the store and took it and nothing was done. They knew, saw them come in. Bands of people just taking whatever they can. 112. You turn from me, God says, I'm going to give you over to these things. And that's what we see happening. Well, verse 40, here in Leviticus 26. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, and they also have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember. I will remember the land. The land also shall be left empty by them and I will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I pour them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But for this, their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, by the hand of Moses. Again, they're not even in the promised land, and God's already talking about their captivity, right? You think that that, that would be like a bell ringing in their heads, right? When we go into this land, man, we got to stay focused, and they would tell their children, and their children would tell their children, and so on. we got to walk with God. It's what's best for us. But it didn't happen. And, you know, we look at our lives and it can be very disheartening and hopeless at times we look at the darkness of this nation this world and like ugh, there is no hope wait a minute there's one word in the bible that brings us hope you're thinking god 
Well, yeah, he does. One word, though. But. But is a big word. But God. He changes everything. I love that. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And he, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You go, man, there's no hope in that. Yeah, verse 4 of Ephesians 2, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Yeah, but God. It changes everything. And I'm so thankful for that. And, and that's what God is saying here to them. But if they confess, but, here, if you confess, I'm going to remember the covenant that I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm going to bring you back. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to break that covenant that I made with you. And that's our God. He's always trying to restore us. God is in the business of restoration, not destruction. Yes, judgment does come, but not after the long suffering and the patience of God to draw people. You know, for Noah, he built the ark for 120 years, right? 120 years. He was a preacher telling people what's well, coming. They didn't believe him. But God's long-suffering, the 120 years. And I see that today. God is very long-suffering. When, when you take a look at all the evil that's going on, you go, God, why aren't you just, you know, kind of like James and John, strike them, Lord. And God's like, you know what? Let's give them some grace here. There's still people who will come to know me. And that's the amazing thing. But when that last Gentile is saved, the Lord's going to call us. When is that going to be? I don't know. I live like it's going to be today, but it could be 10, 15, 20 years down the road. That would make me 75. Yeah, that's as far as I'm going, 20 years. So. Chapter 27 of Leviticus. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your valuation. Now, these are things that are going to be consecrated to God. Voluntary, but God's saying, This is how it's to be done. Look at verse 3. If your valuation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. And if from five years old up to 20 years old, then your valuation for a male shall be 20 shekels, and for a female, 10 shekels. And if from a month old up to five years old, then your valuation for a male shall be five shekels of silver, and for a female, your valuation shall be three shekels of silver. And if from 60 years old and above, if it is a male, then your valuation shall be 15 shekels, and for a female, 10 shekels. But if he is too poor to pay your valuation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall set a value for him according to the ability of him who vowed the priest shall value him. So here we see value assigned to those who are vowing themselves to the Lord. If you are between the ages of 20 and 60, you were more valuable than a child um, because, yeah, you were more beneficial to society, more useful. But the interesting thing is if you couldn't afford it, God doesn't leave you out. They would, the priests would evaluate your resources and come up with a fair price for you to pay. And, you know, how does it apply to us today? Well, first of all, I'm thankful that we're not under this, right? 
I mean, oh my gosh, to remember all this stuff. The priests trained, for, I believe, for several years before they were actually in the ministry um, because all the things they had to learn. Incredible. But think about our own lives for a minute because we, in a sense, vow them to God. We are a living sacrifice to the Lord, and we're all significant. Why? Because we're part of the body of Christ. And every part of the body is important for the body to function correctly. And thus we serve him as we consecrate ourselves to him. Verse 9, And if it's a beast such as men may bring as an offering to the Lord, all such that any man gives to the Lord shall be holy. He shall not substitute it or exchange it for good or for bad, good for bad or bad for good. And if he at all exchanges beast for beast, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. If it is an unclean beast which they do not offer as a sacrifice to the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest, and the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad, as, as you, the priest, value it, so it shall be. But if he wants at all to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth to the valuation. So if you vowed to give a clean animal to the Lord as a sacrifice and you wanted to redeem it, um, you could exchange it with another animal that was clean. Why you would want to do that, I don't know, but there's the, the rule or the law. Uh, if you gave the Lord an unclean animal and then desired to keep it, you would pay the value of the animal, say a donkey, plus 20%, and that kept the, the vow still in place, and the money would be given to the priest to be used in the tabernacle. And again, if you wanted to give it to the priest, this animal, the priest would set a value to it, and he can use the animal or sell it. Um, but again, it's interesting because the priesthood over the years became corrupted. By the time we get to Jesus, they are ripping people off who want to give to God. Well, verse 14. And when a man sanctifies his house to be holy to the Lord, then the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad, as the priest values it, so it shall stand. If he who sanctify it wants to redeem his house, then he shall add one-fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it shall be his. And if a man sanctifies to the Lord some part of a field of his possession, then your valuation shall be according to the seed for it. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. If he sanctifies his field from the year of jubilee, according to your valuation, it shall stand. But if he sanctifies his field after the jubilee, then the priest shall reckon to him the money due according to the years that remain to the year of jubilee, and it shall be deducted from your own valuation. And if he who sanctifies the field ever wishes to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it shall belong to him. But if he does not want to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. But the field, when it is released in the jubilee, shall be holy to the Lord as a devoted field. It shall be the possession of the priest." And if a man sanctifies to the Lord a field which he has bought, which is not the field of his possession, then the priest shall reckon to him the worth of your valuation up to the year of Jubilee, and he shall give you your valuation on that day as a holy offering to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, that field shall return to him from whom it was bought, to the one who owned the land as a possession. And all your valuation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, 20 giras, to the shekel. So now we're talking about houses and land dedicated to the Lord. If a person did this with their home, the priest would set a value on it plus 20% that would go into the treasury of the tabernacle, just like the animals. And that way he could still use the house and keep the vow. Uh, a field that's dedicated to the Lord, if you wanted to keep the vow and yet use the land, the value would be based upon the potential produce of the land as well as the number of years until the year of Jubilee. So these are just a lot of rules and regulations. Look at verse 26. But the firstling of the beast, which shall be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify, whether it is an ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. And if it is an unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to your valuation, and he shall add one-fifth to it. Or if it is not 
redeem, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. You know, again, back in Exodus 13, verses 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it's mine. So with the firstborn, they were the Lord's, and you couldn't buy them back if it was a clean animal. It was to be sacrificed to the Lord. If it was an unclean animal, it could be sold or bought back uh, from the Lord, and the money was once again given into the treasury of the tabernacle. The firstborn child was redeemed, wasn't sacrificed, of course. <clears throat> Verse 28, Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. So it would seem that devoting something to the Lord was more binding than a vow in, you know, be it man or object or beast. It was totally to the Lord. It couldn't be bought back. Um, now, one could not escape execution by being bought back. You know, they had to face the penalty of the crime that they committed. You know, when King Saul was commanded to bring God's judgment on the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15, they were devoted and doomed to destruction. And Saul failed to do this. Remember the story, you know. Samuel came by and Saul said, King Saul said to Samuel, oh, hey, we destroyed the Amalekites, killed all the, their animals. And what did Samuel say? Well, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? And, and Saul said, well, the, you know, the people, they're kind of hard and they just wanted the best of the land and they kept the best of the land. He didn't even kill the king of the Amalekites. He disobeyed the Lord. And because of that, he ended up Losing the kingdom. Well, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchange for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So if you tithe an animal or seed to the Lord, you could buy it back for the price of the animal or seed plus 20. Um, again, why you wanted to do this? Why you get, would you give something to the Lord and say, I want it back? That's kind of crazy to me, right? I'm giving it to you, Lord. Well, you know what? I need it back. I, I guess I don't get that one. But look, listen how we finish up here tonight. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. Keep in mind, they're still at Mount Sinai. They've been there for almost a year. And they're going to be moving. As we get into Numbers, we'll see them traveling. And by the time we get to the end of Numbers, they are uh, again at the border of the Promised Land. Uh, Jericho is on the other side of the Jordan, and they're preparing uh, to enter into the uh, land of Canaan. And again, these are not suggestions. These are commandments that the Lord gave to Moses and Moses gave to the children of Israel. And, you know, I think if you take anything out of Leviticus, take this away. Holiness to the Lord. Because if you look at Leviticus, it's all about God's holiness and how we cannot approach a holy God in our own righteousness. We can't, not even close. You know, I like what, and I'll finish up with this from Warren Worsby. He said, for several years I've had a plaque on the wall of my study containing this quotation from A.W. Tozer. To know God is at once the easiest and the most difficult thing in the world. I like that. Knowing God and becoming more like him is the easiest thing in the world because God is for us and he gives us all the help we want as we seek to attain the goal. 
but it's the hardest thing because almost everything within us and around us fights against us, and we have to exercise a holy determination to run the race and keep our eyes on the Lord. But it can be done. Otherwise, God would never have said eight times in his word, Be holy, for I am holy. His commandment is the promise of his enablement. Be holy. Absolutely. That's what God desires in our lives, that we are living lives to honor him. When people see us, they see how much we love God by the things we do, the things we say, the compassion we have towards people. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the book of Leviticus. It's not an easy book to go through. And Lord, again, it just shows us your holiness and how we can approach you in our righteousness, which are like filthy rags. We need the righteousness of Christ imputed into our lives by faith. We need that holiness that can only come from you. And Lord, we need your spirit to enable us to live the lives you want us to live. But we also have to surrender to you. We have to obey you, just like the children of Israel did. We thank you so much for being our God. And just guide us, Lord, as we walk with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.